Again, we're here today at the Hunter Byrne Memorial Lorcana Championship. We want to thank the Hunter Byrne Memorial Foundation for hosting this tournament. This is their 10th anniversary for the tournament. They always raise awareness for suicidal ideation within the gaming community and have a local outreach community program to try to raise awareness of mental health. If you would like to donate, this year's charity is 988. It's a suicide and crisis lifeline. 988 is a U.S. national number that you can dial anytime you or a loved one are facing suicidal ideations or a mental health crisis. Hello and welcome to the Hunter Burton Memorial's first ever Lorcana Championship. We're here in the top four watching Aaron, aka Lorcana Bro, versus Remington. We saw these two in the last feature match against each other, well, against two different opponents, and they won. And now they're here in the top four. I'm Sir Ashtown with 20 Lore Pro. Thank you so much for joining us today, Liam, with the Illumiteers. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks. We've got, we've got Aaron here too. She's. Holding our, holding our newborn. <laughs> hey, or our Aaron. infant now. When do they stop being newborns? She's infant, right? That's the word? Infant. Six months. Appreciate you have, having you as well, Aaron. Well, here we are uh, going into top four. Uh, we watched Julius play against a Amber Steel song list and had ultimately lost that match. And so I believe in the other feature match we'll see here in a moment, we should see a Amber Steel deck list. Yeah, this this is super, super exciting. You know, I I never take for granted, um, I hope nobody takes for granted, whenever you get to see, you know, two of the top players, you know, in a particular game, in this case, Lorcana, you know, going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, both these players know their deck inside and out. They also know their opponent's deck. You know, these deck lists are, are public at this point. And um, you're going to get to see like some of the best Lorcana play from some of the best Lorcana players, and it's it's just fantastic. And in two very popular decks right now, um, you know Ruby Amethyst, we know it. Uh, some of us love it, some of us hate it. But then the new star on the scene is uh, Ruby Sapphire, which I feel like has really broken into the to the top of the meta um, within the last couple of weeks. This is really like you were saying, Liam, competitive Lorcana at its finest. We've seen Aaron do great things at other 1Ks at PPG Houston, getting second place. Remington has is not uh he's super familiar with being on the feature match. He is a competitive player, and seeing him here today in the top four makes a lot of sense. Same thing with Remington. We've seen him at other 1Ks and we've seen him compete before and He's been playing great all day, as we've seen him on the feature match as well. We see Aaron here with the new Rafiki. Love seeing this challenger. Really a strong card, even though he's a 0-2. And someday, maybe Hyenas will be relevant, because that secondary ability seems very strong. That's true. Get your Rafikis now before, before Ed comes <laughs> along and, and breaks the meta. Here we go. A little, little fun uh, hey, hey here, sliding over to Mont Nui, um, reducing Aaron's lore by, by one, taking it back down to zero. Um, I mentioned this last match, but I, I like how Remington here, that this TTP of using, um, oh, sorry, that's a military term, this tactic, this technique here of using um, you know, tokens to indicate which characters are at you know, specific locations. I think it benefits everybody to, to be clear on what the board state is. Um, Aaron with, with Maui here, you know, Maui's always been popular uh, in these Ruby Amethyst deck lists, but I feel like it's even more popular now as an answer for these high willpower locations. Uh, Maui, especially partnering with his fish hook sometimes, being able to, to one-shot uh, most of the locations, I think all the locations um, that, that people are playing. So 
uh, Maui really showing some some versatility uh, in in this new uh, this new season. Speaking of Maui's fish hook, there it is, uh, allowing Hey Hey uh, to take down the much more powerful Maui. <laughs> uh, hey Hey wielding that Whoa. fish hook, uh, maybe plucking it out of the ocean uh, to take Maui down. I wouldn't doubt that character Hey Hey getting into a lot of, of uh, mischievous adventures, especially with Maui's fish, uh, fish hook. That's true. Yeah, this card is a little nuts. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll try to ease off the puns. There we have Sumerian Talisman, uh, sending Grandma Tala in to uh, finish off um, Maleficent and uh, turning into ink there. If there's two things that Sapphire does well, it's items and ramp, um, and that's what Remington is doing here uh, through the mid-game, uh, working towards the late game. I was talking about this earlier in a previous round, but this talisman can really start to do a lot of work just as you're getting characters out there and starting to challenge, and it it just can start adding up over time. That's a great point. If there's one thing that Ruby kind of lacked, there's a lot of things it did well, you know, removal and, you know, aggression, but if there's one thing that it didn't do well, it was card drop. And so Sumerian Talisman, even though it requires some setup, uh, giving Ruby something that it really needed, um, which, is, which is some card draw. Well, as these two competitors are playing, let's head on over to the other feature match on the top four. This match featuring Joe playing Amber Steel versus Ronald playing Amethyst Ruby. Oh, man, this is, this is a, a fun matchup. So one thing I want to highlight right here, Steel Song, um, you know, is a great list that we've seen ever since set one. Um, but in the recent sets, and particularly in, in this set, um, you know, it got a couple tools which made it even better better um and and that is some of these early game shifters um that allowed you to sing a whole new world perhaps earlier than than you otherwise would have on turn three so here we see for example the robin hood setup as a first turn uh card a vanilla card but it really sets up as a shift target for the three cost uh robin hood champion of sherwood um so uh, I just wanted to mention it because this is a line that, that seems to be set up here. Um, Joey able to sing a uh, whole new world this turn if he has that Robin Hood set up. And then he has, you know, Cinderella Ballroom Sensation. There it is. Um, Cinderella Ballroom Sensation as a, um, as a singer to sing perhaps a, a three cost song um, immediately after refilling his hand. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, Steel Song, you know, always popular, but um, getting that new tool in there. There it is. Um, as if it was scripted. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, the that uh, and and I wish should I should also mention you know the queen also um, similar line you can play with uh, with the queen um, putting that the five cost queen out early on turn two um, to sing a whole new world. Robin Hood just feels better um, because of that six willpower and some of the card draw it gives you um, it. Uh, it just feels like a much better play. Um, so kind of probably the, probably w the perfect opening for Joey here. If not perfect, pretty close. One that would definitely leave me as a player across from him baffled watching the Queen shift singing Whole New World. And <laughs> looking at Joey's list, it does contain all of the shift versions for the one drops. You see the Cinderella singer that can transform later on with a little bit more ink into the larger Cinderella Stouthearted. Just as you were saying, Liam, the Robin Hood, the Queen, all of those one-drop shifters are available in Joey's deck, and he does have them to be able to shift into later on. Ronald playing his Prince Eric, a really strong card that when banished can choose to banish a targeted character. Yeah, so obviously that, that Sheriff uh, tempting target for that Prince Eric, uh, some removal uh, to take it off the board. So Joey's going to be looking to maximize um, uh, use of, of that character this turn before it probably inevitably is banished by uh, Prince Eric. 
You see him ink another Robin Hood champion of Sherwood. This will at least be some nice two lore while getting rid of another character on Ronald's field. Now, a real great setup here. Three damage on there. Uh, I know he's running Rapunzel. He's one Rapunzel. Um, so that, uh, that is something available too if he wants to stack his hand even more. But there we have the Shift Queen. Wow, could this be a game where we see all the one drops get shifted into? Using the Queen to uh, modify both uh, his Cinderella's power and then the power, I'm sorry, the strength of Maleficent uh, in order to allowing that, allowing him to remove that character. Uh, very low cost, uh, very, not even a trade. Good. But, but more importantly here again, um, I will say, you know, Prince Eric there probably, well, Prince Eric probably is going to remove uh, Sheriff. I think that's what, um, you know, Ronald's probably looking to do with it. Um, maybe take out two characters uh, if possible, but um, having that five cost queen on the board now gives him another, um, you know, the ability to sing a couple songs, whole new world, grab your swords, etc. So in Steel Song, having a five cost character on the board is always, always uh, valuable. That's like the picture perfect place you want to be is having that five ink character be able to sing all of those great songs that are in this Amber Steel Song list. Well, as we're looking at this gameplay, let's head on over to the other match here in the top four. Back to Aaron and Remington. A lot of things going on here on the board. You know, I mean, immediately my eyes go up to the top of the screen, Aaron managing to um, you know, accumulate lore over time, uh, sitting there at 11. Uh, Remington still waiting for, for his first lore, kind of setting up his end game. Although with a, with a three lore Gaston on the board, um, so you know, if, if he chooses to be able to gain a little bit of lore there. Um, Aaron's showing three cards in hand, four cards in hand. So still, still some gas there. Um, Actually five cards, goodness from Aaron. Oh yeah, that's, that is Amethyst, wow. isn't it? That is Amethyst. Goodness. So much card draw. Remington making a big play with his lucky diamond, seven, seven ink. Hmm, there it is. So here we have the first lore, uh, using that lucky diamond to take advantage of Gaston on the board here. Um, also worth pointing out, you know, that... Uh, okay. So using the fish hook to give Gaston evasive, uh, and then Gaston questing for three. The fish hook really doing some work here. So just like that, six lore on the board. And one wow, thing I was going to note... So um, Oh, there, Dragonfire. Uh, Aaron does run two Dragonfires, uh, you know, for scenarios just like this um, and showing the payoff there. Not a card that we saw in, in many um, Ruby Amethyst lists uh, last set. They started to creep in there at the end, but here we're showing the value. Um, what I keep trying to point out before then things keep happening is four items on the board there for Remington. So Tamatoa, uh, if it's dropped, is a um, five lore character uh, with those four items on the board. So Lucky Dime able to make use of that um, right away. So when you're playing against Tamatoa and Lucky Dime, always count the items. That's something that I'm glad to see more of in these Ruby Sapphire lists is that we're seeing more and more items be played, but then staying on the board. I know that Flavor Sham is able to draw you two cards, especially when he ETBs and when he leaves the battlefield or when he quests. But having all these items on the board, like you're saying, really powers up your lucky diamond. So if that's your high cost payoff card in the end, playing that alongside a Tamatoa is incredibly strong. There's a Madame Medusa taking out Aaron's Rafiki. Choosing to use that Popsicle to heal Maui, maybe indicating that he doesn't quite have that Tamatoa yet. And he also protected it from the Madame M. Fox by giving it evasive with the Maui's fish hook. Yeah. 
There's Aaron getting a lore with that spell book on the right side of the board there. Yeah, just creeping, creeping closer. And at this point, you know, Goat starts to starts to look scarier and scarier <laughs> as you get closer to 20 lore. There's a Pinocchio. He just wanted it on the board. He didn't care who it targeted. Mm -hmm. So close to the end of the game at this point that, um, you know, every lore matters. So, um, you know, Remington has a few things here. He does have B prepared in this deck. Uh, he could clear the board. Um, there's Gaston uh, digging a little bit, looking for something. You know, uh, Aaron showing uh, one lore with the spell book, and he's got, you know, three more on the board with characters. So, um, really needing to do something about it, at least. You know, at least one of those characters, um, two of those characters, actually. Yeah, it's, this... It's late. Your brain gets foggy <laughs> by the time you reach the semifinals. You're right here. Aaron really looking here with the 17. He's got quite a bit of lore here available to him on his turn. If Remington can't find a way to either clear the board or use some removal targeted... Yeah, it's, and it's just such a challenge. You know, Remington knows, too, there's goats, there's bounce goats, and so, um, you know, once you get to this point in the game, you're really luck. You know, you have to be lucky as well as, um, you know, have, have the answers for what's showing on the board. And unfortunately, Remington didn't uh, that game. I think Remington just kind of saw how high Aaron's lore count was right there and wasn't able to find like the Tamantola, like we were saying, that would have really turned a lot of things around. Let's take a quick look into the other match here in the top four. Here we go. We are, we are still in game one and uh, a lot less on the board than when we, uh, when we saw it last, <laughs> right, Wesley? Yeah, this is kind of clear. We had a lot of shift characters from the Cinderella, not the Cinderella, I'm sorry, the Robin Hood, Captain Sherwood and the Queen, and, and now all of that's kind of gone. Mm. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a there's a bee prepared somewhere um, in that discard pile over there. But something I was going to highlight is a lot of players who like to stay incredibly disciplined and know the odds or their advantages of drawing a certain cards in their deck like to kind of fa fan out their banish pile, as we see here with Joe. He can kind of easily look over to his banish pile and kind of see... Well, I've played two of this card. I now know my odds of drawing into it are X. So that's great to see that uh, players at this level are, are doing that type of odds comparison or percentages at least. Yeah, especially when you're playing a whole new world. You know, you want to know what answers are left. I, I, speaking of a whole new world, I think I see two in the discard pile. So, you know, when you're playing Steel Song, you always like to know how many are left. Um, and uh, based on what I can see right now, there's, there's, there's probably two. But here we go. Both players kind of rebuilding their board. Uh, Ronald, you know, taking advantage of some, some card draw off Maleficent. Um, and both players trying to get back in the swing of things. Um, we do have, you know, the Robin hit out again. It's the shift target um, allowing uh, Joey to drop uh, and immediately uh, there it is. There's the shift. Wow. Um, and you could sing with that immediately or challenge the snake. Um, and of course, uh, Joey gets two lore whenever uh, Robin Hood banishes uh, a character in a challenge. That low cost Robin Hood really turning into this huge Robin Hood champion of Sherwood with a 3 6 body. Just incredibly strong, not only to challenge to gain two lore, but later on to be able to draw a card when it's banished, most likely here by either that goat or maybe even another card like a Madman Fox if it comes into play. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right, and and one of the things you know that makes this Robin Hood so valuable is the six and the willpower line. Um, you know, a lot of steel decks out there right now, and a lot of people are running along. And then along came Zeus, which does five damage um, to characters, and so that six and the willpower line really sets this Robin Hood apart from many, many, many other mid-game uh, cards, uh, allowing it to survive. You know, a direct shot from Zeus. Along came Zeus, really a strong card, not only doing the, the five damage to a character, but to location, seeing so much play, making Robin Hood, like you were saying, Liam, that much more important with its six toughness. 
Absolutely. We'll see what Ronald's doing here. He's got quite a bit of ink to be able to use still this turn. Now, and this is, you know, we're seeing here, oh, there's the be prepared. <laughs> Ronald says, I don't like the look of this. <laughs> Let's reset things and start again. Just having two very strong singers in both Ariel and with the champion of Sherwood on board, the Robin Hood, it makes clearing the board more worthwhile, causing your opponent to have to use their ink in order to play whatever song that they want to sing. Well, we're looking here at top four with Ronald and Joey. Let's head on over back to Aaron versus Remington. Oh, and we are off. Looking a little chilly over there on Remington's side of the board. A lot of frozen popsicles there. <laughs> Able to be eaten later on by a damaged character or uh, maybe a flavor sham. That's true. And there's Cusco, the emperor at his lowest state here in his llama form. There's that turn three fish quill by Remington. Really what you want to see in this type of ramp style deck. Hmm. Get, that, get that ink flowing. This is interesting because if Aaron has a Madam and Fox, like he just showed right there, he didn't have any characters to, to challenge into, meaning that really he's just playing that 4-3 to have it on the board, not really gaining a whole lot of advantage from bouncing back that Cusco like you would from another character, but at least having that 4-3 on the board can uh, set you up for maybe a Merlin Crab into this Flavor Sham, who I'm sure Aaron doesn't want to see on the board for too long. No, that's absolutely right. Flibbersham loves eating popsicles uh, and giving you cards, so um, not ideal to have him out there uh, on turn four uh, with, your, with those popsicles there. <laughs> if you're playing against it, if you're Remington, it's, it's delightful. Remington, you're great. Makes me almost want to, actually it does in fact make me want to go back and watch Zootopia. Ah, what a delightful, delightful film. Montanui into the inkwell. There's Madame that. Medusa says, no more, no more bouncing uh, for the rabbit, um, making Aaron get minimum value out of, out, of that, uh, out of that card. I've been seeing a lot of players today who are playing Ruby, and if they're playing against Ruby Amethyst, they wait to kind of play this Madame Medusa until they see a rabbit or a strong bounce target. Uh, that way they can prevent their opponent from gaining any type of advantage from them. There's a Maui to take care of that flavor sham. Maui today for a lot of these Ruby decks just pulling in a lot of work. Yeah, it's just it's just such a good card. Um such a good card so many uh high willpower locations out there now so many high willpower characters like flavor sham um and uh, uh maui's value has not gone down any uh since the first set was premiered um if anything it's only gone up with the addition of locations That Stitch able to trade with the Madam and Fox. Uh, what a great addition being at two, even though it's uninkable. Really, that three attack power makes it such a good challenger and worth being included, at least in Rubbington's mindset, at least having two of in his list. Rabbit's so good. Um, Aaron building up here towards turn seven when he unlocks Be Prepared and some other options in his deck. Bouncing the Rabbit. Um, getting cards, drawing into answers. That's kind of Amethyst style here. We, it's kind of nice to see the draw power from Sapphire going on with the popsicles and flavor sham, and we're seeing the draw power from Aaron with Amethyst. 
this bouncing recursion and replaying of cards. Really trying to see which of these two players can build up the most resources in their hand to have the best answers when they're needed. There's Aaron replaying a Merlin Rabbit. Three cards off that Rabbit now, just so much value. Yeah, that's why using that Madame Medusa earlier on one of the Rabbits, at least getting rid of that, so that way at least the one can't be recurred. Uh, it was really important. <laughs> you all are, are hearing my daughter in the background here. She's uh, she wants to be part of the stream. She's she's very excited for Lurkana, um, so uh, contributing in her own way. Glad to be here at the first ever Lorcana Championship and to have the youngest caster alongside with us today. That's true. <laughs> Setting records here. Milestones being broken. Yeah, I was, I would, you know, looking at this match, I, I think it's setting up, it was setting up, you know, very nicely for Remington. It was kind of going, you know, the way he wanted it to go. Um, for Aaron, you know, he's, he's pacing himself, he's taking his time, but really what he, what he wants to do is, is you know, develop his, his ink well um, and have, you know, draw enough cards that he has the answers that, that he needs at the end of the game. And um, in the mid game, just drawing so many cards off the rabbit. Um, that, uh, that, gosh, I mean, he has probably what he wants to have in his hand uh, for this endgame here. Two Queen's Castles in play. Um, four lower on the board and, and such a challenge. But Tamatoa coming down here for Remington, uh, you know, getting uh, some lore off those items. So with four lore now, um, That's something that I've seen from some of these players today at this high level where they play out what they need to in order to draw out a be prepared. And then they themselves, after they've gotten their opponent to do it, they just slam down these locations like the Queen's Castle. But we see here that uh, Aaron having to respond to that Tamatoa, not wanting to leave it on the board for any more turns than just the one, can really take away the game with Lucky Dime. Right, and that Tamatoa doing, you know, two things, obviously, you know, able to gain some, some lore quickly, but also, um, you know, one way that, um, there's, there's one of the answers for, for locations there. Uh, ideally, Remington would like, you know, the fish hook to go along with it, um, but at the very least, able to put some damage on, uh, on that location. Uh, you know, one of the things that we see in these Ruby Amethyst decks now um, is locations, two lower locations like the Queen's Castle serving as finishers. Um, in kind of your end game play. Um, and so that's exactly what Aaron's done here is, is set up those locations to be the end game for him. And so he's looking to keep as many characters off the board as possible to allow them to stick, um, getting him closer to 20 lore. And then he can close out the game with a spell book or a goat or a bounce goat. Wow, even here, like you were saying, protecting those locations and using his own Maui to take out Remington's Maui, making sure that they have another turn to live even though that hey hey can come into that queen's castle that's been damaged. Yeah, it's just, it's such a challenge, you know, playing against Ruby Amethyst, because once, you know, we pointed out before, but, you know, once these decks get to about, you know, 15, 16 lore, um, it's just a matter of time, uh, because the goat, you know, will come out, bounce, you know, not allowed to respond, a spellbook coming down, giving you lore instantly. Um, so that, that, that 15, 16, 17 lore mark um, you really want to keep them away from that if possible. I mean, watch as the Queen's Castle is pushing Aaron closer and closer. That's something, just gaining that passive lore with that Queen's Castle, and when you can clear your opponent's board like he, like Aaron just did with the Be Prepared, you're really able to solidify that you're going to go up every turn. Aaron's list only playing one spell book. We see him come down with the Rafiki onto the Queen's Castle. And really here, just defending that castle. Um, Remington, uh, you know, hoping to draw into something. I mean, to clear that in one turn, um, you know, Remington really needs a, a fish hook and a Maui. Um, at the very least, he'd like something to put some damage on it. Um, not sure he can remove both the character and the location. Um, 
but let's Remington see what here he... making his play with a Maui. So there's the Maui damage on the location. That's not. That's not nothing. That's quite a bit of damage on there. I'm getting word from our producer that Joey, the Amber Steel Song player from the other feature match, did take game one using his champion Robin Hood champion Sherwoods and his aerials in order to get in the win. There's a Judy Hop on Remington side of the board. Aaron taking his turn, drawing more cards, but having gone up to 17 now, like you were saying, Liam, really into goat range here. Just putting out any character that Aaron can on the board right now, with seeing these Cusco's and the Maui fish hook. Really just want to set up the best he can to demand a be prepared or at least take it away with this Queen's Castle. Uh, he. Uh... You said it. He, he demanded to be prepared, and I think we're going to see it. Um, <laughs> uh, here we go. Removing uh, location. Oh, but maybe not. All right. So saving to be prepared. Um, we know it's an option, and instead, um, removing you know several cards here. Leaving just Kuzco on the board, uh, able to get Aaron one lore closer to victory. That Cusco there, just like in his art, really staring down a board across from him that looks quite frightening. We'll see what Lord, what Aaron can do here at K. Lorcana Bros. Trying to wrap it up, getting the last bits of lore in. Maui into hops. Aaron uh, using the fish hook, most likely there to give uh, Cusco evasive, um, putting the fish hook on top of Cusco to indicate uh, that board state. And Pinocchio coming down, representing really here just one more lore. Um, and uh, between Pinocchio and Cusco, uh, that's showing uh, you know win condition there. Oh, win um, condition I'm plus one. I think too, if Aaron had the goat, you think he would have played it last turn because if he would have gone up to. 19 and then be prepared you know it's coming absolutely if he had the goat there he would have he would have played the goat um so aaron unfortunately seems goatless uh at this point um remington with the be prepared clearing the board able to draw a card off of the bench from the cusco ah there's the rabbit looking for the goat. Remington taking a quick look. I'm guessing he's looking at the odds of what Aaron has played so far this match. Yeah, maybe looking, maybe looking for goats. Trying to see how many are in there, if any. There were none, in case anybody <laughs> was wondering. Maybe some in the inkwell. We don't know. There we go again. Aaron just throwing all the lore on the board. Uh, Trying to get enough to stick to close this game out. Maui's fish hook giving the rabbit evasive. It doesn't matter mm. when you have Maleficent. <laughs> Nuking the rabbit, uh, giving Aaron a, another card, though. I will say I have seen before with Aaron where his opponent was at 19 lore and Aaron came back from 2 lore and won the game. It is possible to happen. It happened at a Lorcana 1K at Evolutions Trading during the finals. Interesting to see if that might happen in the reverse. Huh. Uh, that's, a, that's a fun note. Um... You know, one of the things we may have been looking for, uh, you know, in the discard pile, see how many rabbits uh, had been played, and it looks like uh, all four um, <laughs> making an appearance this game. How many Merlins does it take to find a goat? It takes uh, all four and least, more in this at case. At least four, apparently. <laughs> and bouncing them repeatedly. Aaron getting in there at 19. 
Judy hops, uh, eating the popsicle, drawing a card. Oh, he showed his hand. Needed to be prepared to close it out. Uh, didn't draw into it. So, Aaron taking game two. Wow. What a great match from Aaron and Remington. Aaron really showing his diligence and just methodically playing through his lines, looking for what he needed, and presenting the characters on board that would draw out Remington's Be Prepared in order to get him the match. Let's take a look at our other feature match. Joey playing Amber Steele versus Ronald playing Ruby Amethyst. Joey, of course, as we had said earlier, had taken game one. He had that huge board set up with the Queens and the Robin Hood champion of Sherwood was able to take game one. Ronald over here playing Ruby Amethyst, now having a Merlin Rabbit along with a Minnie Mouse. It looks like Joey is down one ink compared to his opponent. Could be depending on the turn that it's on. Possibly Ronald went first this match. I'm guessing so since he had lost the first game. Joey having two of those flutes over on the bottom left of the screen for you to see. Every time he sings a song, he's going to be able to gain two lore. And Joey having a really strong singer here in Cinderella. The Cinderella could be quite scary, especially because the shift Cinderella is in Joey's list. He plays two of them, but is also able to sing really a lot of Joey's songs pretty well. Some of those songs being one of the best from Into the Inklands in Amber, The Bare Necessities. Able to get rid of some of the peskier cards from Ronald's hand, like Be Prepared. And just as I had just talked about. Seeing it in action here. Instead, getting rid of a spell book. Honestly, just getting anything off of it seems pretty good, though. <laughs> the worst feeling would be to not get anything. I know, it feels bad. But at the very least, you get information. That's true, too. And that, and that is helpful. I remember doing set one, playing against Amber Steel Song players, and they would play Ariel. And back then, we didn't have as many songs as we do now. And a lot of times, they would whiff and not get up any songs off the top four. And so, glad to see songs like uh, The Bare Necessities be included in these decks. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. A couple of Robin Hoods coming down for some board presence here. Joey being very methodical, thinking through his lines here. You know, what Joey's looking to do with these two flutes... So oftentimes in Steel Song decks, I think, you know, you want to see flutes later in the game. You don't want to see them super early, because there's other things you want to be doing in the first few turns. Um, so this indicating Joey probably drew into these flutes, and um, having them stuck in his hand, chose to get him out, you know, a little earlier. At this point, you know, what Joey is looking to do is, at some point... A whole new world, refill his hand, and then just play a song or two, you know, every turn, two lore a turn, get closer and closer and closer to, um, you know, to 20 lore. Um, unfortunately, you know, no, no singer on the board. Um, he can draw into a, into a Robin Hood uh, uh, champion of Sherwood uh, to shift into that. Um, but really looking to fill his hands with songs at this point and um, start to use those flutes to to get closer to the end of the game. And Joey playing out more characters, most likely due to the fact that he had saw information that Ronald didn't have be prepared in hand, setting up the board for a possible shift into the champion of Sherwood. And there it is. Robin Hood holding one of my favorite uh, characters in that franchise, Tagalong. <laughs> that's, the, that's the best name. Well, don't say you don't have good commentators as we're here guessing and uh, calling out the plays as we see them. <laughs> <laughs> 
that uh, Robin Hood really looking to clean up something here and gain some lore for Joe. Yeah, it decides is. to take out this rabbit. That way, Ronald won't be able to bounce it, most likely, and continue to have more card advantage. Pushing the lore total here a little bit. Yeah, so gaining two lore off the, off the challenge, um, and then gaining two lore off the questing. Really, those flutes are similar to Spellbook uh, in this deck, in that you can almost count on a Steel Song deck running the number of songs it does, having a song every turn. That's kind of the plan, is, is one song a turn. So one song a turn means two lore a turn. And so, you know, what Joey's looking at now with his 10 lore is probably about a, a five turn clock. And so every time he can push, you know, a little bit extra lore, get a little bit closer to 20, you're just cutting off a turn and getting, you know, one turn closer. So um, Ronald here, you know, wants to do two things. One, keep singers off the board um, so that, that Joey can't get free songs at the very least. And two, start pushing that lore total higher. Um, it's, unless you have item removal, which Ruby uh, Amethyst does not, um, hard to deal with those flutes. So really having to start thinking about, you know, trying to get as close to 20 as possible, uh, getting within goat range of closing out this game. And we see here, Joey, uh, I don't know if you had noticed this earlier, he's only playing one of this. But it's a card that has begun to see more play is a bodyguard blue. Just what he's got bodyguard, and then whenever he's banished, gains two lore. So if there's a be prepared that gets played, you gain two lore. If you're trying to take out one of Joey's other characters, gain two lore. Has really shown up in a way that uh, you don't want to quite challenge it if your opponent gets close to 16, 17 lore. Yeah, and it, and it quests for Allure. No, you're exactly right. I, I do think, you know, we're seeing a bit more of Baloo. Um, the one thing working against him is he is uninkable. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of songs uh, being run in these Steel Song decks that are uninkable from Along Came Zeus, to Grab Your Swords, Homely World. So I, I, I'm glad you mentioned Baloo. I'd, I'd venture to guess we'd see a lot more of him um, in these decks if he was inkable. I know the 20 lore team has been looking at a aggro list that involves Blue as one of the main bodyguards in the list, and he seems like a fun card in concept, and so excited to see if it can really pay off in the future for some deck lists. Champion of Sherwood there, getting another two lore. Um, and to your point, you know, that, that Blue, um, you know, really represents at least one lore a turn um, at this point uh, until Ronald chooses to remove it and put it closer. So um, between the flutes and the blue, um, you know, Joey's kind of within striking distance here um, of closing out this game. Those flutes uh, sat for a long time, but when they do get used, I mean, having two of them out like that, that's a lot of lore to be gaining. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I do think we've seen flutes, uh, you know, their popularity has waxed uh, and waned and then waxed again. Um, I think they were very popular in the first set um, in the initial uh, Steel Song build. And then in set two, they fell out of favor a little bit. And people, uh, because they're uninkable, people went more towards board control and using Steel Song to just, you know, just dominate the board and then close out the game on its own terms. And now I think we see them coming back into favor a little bit um, into these lists. So it's fun to see. That blue having gotten banished by that Madam M. Fox gaining Joey two more lore going up to 17. I think you're right. It's kind of nice to see these flutes back. It, it is very reminiscent, like you were saying, from Chapter 1. And maybe we'll start seeing more of them, depending on these lists and the ink uninkable counts that they're trying to find a balance between. You know, this, this, is, God, this game is on a knife's edge right now. You know, um... Against Amethyst, especially, you know, these lists, we know you have the goat in there. We talk about the goat all the time, I know, but we have to. Um, you know, a goat bounce is, is two lore. Um, and then Ronald showing, uh, you know, three lore on the board. You know, so three lore plus, you know, a goat bounce is 18. So Ronald's almost within striking distance as well. 
Um, Joey, you know, is looking to have, oh, and there we go. Whole New World. As I say that, you know, I said wow. Joey's hoping to have songs to play here. And Whole New World, uh, importantly, that gives him two lore. And uh, a third. Odds are he's going to draw another song. That's wow. the flute. And that's three. That's amazing. Drawing into a flute to get the win. Golly. That's amazing. Well, that was top four with Joey and Ronald. Joey really playing that Amber Steel song in such a way that it just highlighted how it can steamroll and roll over using those songs, using the flutes, Robin Hood champion Sherwood, and created just an opportunity for them to gain the lore that was needed there at the end to win the match. Well, see, I'm going to step away for just a moment as we get ready for this last match. Um, I hate to, hate to ban you, but I'm going to, I'm going to leave you to it for a second. <laughs> no, you're good. Thank you so much for joining us, Liam. <laughs> yeah. But... Well, for those of you joining us on Twitch, we will join you here looking into the finals of the Hunter Burden Memorial Lorcana Championship. Thank you all so much for joining us here today.